go ahead and turn in your Bibles this morning to a book we've been in for now for a little over two years. Lord willing, we're going to finish it up in November. Uh, but go ahead and turn in the book of Acts. And while you're turning there, I've entitled the message, At a More Convenient Time. At a More Convenient Time. Time. You know, the Bible gives many examples of missed opportunities and times where people sort of just pushed off the decision uh, concerning salvation. Uh, the, the philosophers at Mars Hill, if you remember back in Acts 12, they said, we'll, we'll hear you again on this matter. Well, Paul left Athens never to return. And so they didn't hear again. Over in Luke chapter 9 and verses 57 through 62 records the last opportunities of some would-be disciples, but each came with their own excuses. Remember, uh, let me first bury my father. Uh, let me first say goodbye to my family and on and on missed opportunities to come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior. Even over in Matthew chapter 19 verses 21 and 22 tells of the story of uh, the rich young ruler who walked away sorrowful. Because he didn't want to give up his money. Missed opportunity. In this, the text this morning, we've got a story of a wicked couple uh, who are told by the Apostle Paul that as a result of the finished work of Christ, we just sang about it there, of Christ on Calvary, the cross, righteousness could be received and self-control could be possible, but judgment would be rendered at due time for the just and the unjust. So here we have a record of their response to decide, oh, there'll be a more convenient time. Uh, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Hopefully you found your way to Acts chapter 24. We're going to read verses 22 through 27 this morning. It says, but when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceeding and said, when L Lysias... The commander comes down. I'll make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty. Told him not to uh, forbid any of his friends to provide for or, vi or visit him so he could have visitors. We saw that last week. But I wanted to touch base there again because that was just another time that he sort of got an opportunity to sort of pass the buck down the road. Kick the can down the road. Then it goes, and after some days, so a few days passed, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, I don't know about anybody, but I'm not going to be naming my daughter Drusilla, but anyway, <laughs> who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now when I have a, more con when I have a convenient time I'll call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, he was succeeded by another person there. Portius Fetus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanting to do... The Jewish the Jews of favor left Paul bound at a more convenient time. Would you pray for him with me? God, I pray this morning, Lord. Lord, your words would penetrate hearts. And God, I pray that, God, if there is one here this morning that does not know you as Savior, God, I pray today would be a day that changes their life and their eternity forever. Speak, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Simple takeaway this morning. It's a very simple statement. There'll be no second chances in hell. There'll be no second chances in hell. This morning's going to be a little different message. This morning, for a few minutes, I want to talk to you uh, about the greatest need and decision on earth. There's only an allotted amount of time 
to make that decision. The first thing we see in this text is the possibility they're given to Felix. We see here, it says that he heard Paul. Now, Felix was the governor, procurator of Judea in, in AD 52, and his wife, Drusilla, it was actually, she was one of three daughters of Herod Agrippa I. Now, Felix has swayed her. This is the kind of guy that was serving as governor. Now, look, I'm not going to say anything about governors, but we got some, some pieces of work out there in America, but this guy here is a piece of work, too. Uh, he had swayed her, Drusilla, to leave her former husband, the king of Emesa, uh, and he had swayed her and persuaded her to come and marry him. Uh, and he had used a magician to do it. But one of her sisters, Bernice, married King Agrippa. Her father, this is, this is all about Drusilla, her father, Herod Agrippa I, murdered James, John's brother, sought to kill Peter. Her great uncle, Herod Antipas, uh, killed John the Baptist and her great-grandfather, Herod the Great's the one, remember, that when Christ was born, he started killing all the babies in Bethlehem and sought to kill Jesus. That's Drusilla's family. So her, she didn't fall, as we know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And so, so but, but this, this is a, a possibility for her and Felix to hear Paul. Some scholars actually believe it was Drusilla's curiosity to hear Paul that made her responsible for this particular meeting. Though she's Jewish, she knew the Ten Commandments. She didn't live anything like she knew the Lord because she didn't. Now, what kind of possibility could anyone have? Think about it. The, the chance, the opportunity to hear Paul. Uh, what would be the possibility that Paul would one day stand before these two, share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, but a sovereign God. I just wonder how many possibilities have we had to share the gospel and didn't. I wonder how many of you here this morning may not be saved that's heard the gospel many times, had the possibility to hear it, and still have made no decision. Sovereign God. Romans 1 and 19 and 20 tells us that none will be without excuse. There's going to be a possibility to hear the gospel for every single person. Even in Acts 17, uh, we remember they talked about, uh, Paul talked about, they commanded all men everywhere to repent. I mean, this is a possibility, an opportunity. They get an opportunity to hear the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and apart from Jesus Christ, has been the greatest statesman of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are given the possibility to hear the gospel and to make a decision for eternity. I just wonder how many have had the possibility. We know all have and all will. But I wonder how many's done anything with it or possibly they've done what Felix did. We're going to get about that in just a minute. But we see the possibility there. Then we see the proclamation given to Felix. Now, we see him, Paul, it talks about he goes on to share with them many things. Now, I want you to understand they heard him. They talked about right here in the Bible. It says they heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Uh, Paul, I believe, was burdened about making sure that they heard. I think Paul was burdened about making sure that all people heard the gospel. I believe that's why he went on three missionary journeys. I believe that's why he was willing to be beat. I believe that's why he was willing to travel uh, so far and, and in destitute areas to make sure that he was faithful in getting the gospel to every single person. And I think it was important to him. Can I tell you it ought to be important to us? I think it ought to be important to us. That we share the gospel. Uh, even ever in Jude, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting to you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once and all delivered from saints. We have something that has been delivered to us, and we need to share it. Paul discussed the gospel, I believe. I believe he discussed his personal testimony. I believe he shared with them the Christian beliefs, and he zeroed in uh, it very quickly on every sinner's dilemma. I believe this is a picture of 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, when, when he was writing over there to Timothy. He says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, ju look, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Can I tell you, we are there. They will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers, heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth 
and be turned aside to faults, to fables. But, 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 but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Can I just tell you, Paul wasn't no itching ear kind of preacher. That's why I like Paul. He, didn't, he, he wasn't worried about the itching ears. He wanted to share what them ears needed to hear. He wasn't no itching ear kind of preacher. Note how his proclamation centered in, I mean, laser beam on a person's greatest need. He says, they reasoned about righteousness. That's a present need for many today. Righteousness. The absolute standard demanded by God's holy nature. Righteousness. We need righteousness to be acceptable to God. A person becomes righteous only through that great exchange we call it. That great exchange when we exchange our sin and receive Christ's righteousness. We just sung about it. Uh, a, a crimson robe turned white. And so, so when you look at this, we exchange our sin for, the, for Christ's righteousness. And he gives us a right standing before God. I just want you to understand for the record's sake, no one will be in heaven. Not one will be in heaven that did not receive the righteousness of Christ through repentance and receiving the Lord Jesus as a personal Savior. Not one will be in heaven. Now, I know you're sitting there, and, some, and I've heard people say, well, I, I tell you, I think I'm about as good as him, and he goes to church all the time. If he can get there, I can get there. Can I tell you, nobody will get there because they were good. Amen. Not one. You can't get good enough. You can't clean yourself up. It takes Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven one day. The only reason I'm going to heaven is because of what Jesus did, not anything I've done. And so he talks about righteousness there. First Peter chapter 3, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the, un, for, the un, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now this has to do with God's expectation on human race. Uh, his nature is holy, and no one can enter his presence, live in fellowship with him, or have the eternal life that he gives without perf uh, perfection and righteousness that only comes through Christ. So, so since we're a failure in this, and all of us are failures in this, uh, God became man, stepped out of heaven, died for us, rose again to impute his righteousness to us. Did you know the word righteousness occurs nearly 40 times in the book of Romans? And we know the book of Romans is one of those rich doctrinal books that Paul wrote, but it occurs almost nearly 40 times. We see righteousness over in Romans 3.10. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. See, right there is enough to tell you, ain't nobody getting to heaven because they good, because the Bible says ain't none of us good. And then it goes on over and says in Romans 3.20, And therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. You can't work your way to him. It troubles me, those religions that think, if I can just get 51% good and 49% bad, I'm going to be all right. He goes on to talk about righteous over in chapter 4 of Romans. Talks about the righteous that comes by faith. And on over in chapter 4 some more in verse 23 it says that God will credit righteous for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Over in Romans 5 it talks about, says that those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness look, will, reign, look, will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I'm certain that Paul spoke about all this stuff. As he was speaking, explaining to Felix. But he, so he reasoned with righteousness. He also reasoned about self-control there in verse 25 too. Now here's a couple that knew nothing about self-control. Uh, she just followed her passions. Uh, and by the way, she was about 16. It says when she went over there to, to marry him, she's probably around the early 20s right now. Uh, but they, she just followed her passions all. And then we had Felix, a, wi a worldly man, a, a worldly man used to getting his own way at the cost of all people uh, by the ruthlessness of his exercise of power. And so they knew no self-control. But did you know as one receives Christ's righteousness, they take on his nature. When we become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we get the Holy Spirit of God that dwells inside of us. And a spirit-filled life bears self-control as a fruit. Uh, listen to me this morning. Paul's words and the Holy Spirit of God must have been making Felix a little uncomfortable by this point. Because he knew he's out of control. And then the Bible says Paul started to reason here about judgment. Judgment. If he wasn't uncomfortable talking about self-control, he's going to get uncomfortable now. Did you know over in James 2 and 19, it says, you believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Demons believe in judgment. 
The apostles believe in judgment. Uh, the apostle John over in Revelation 20, in, in verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such and the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The apostle Paul believed in judgment. He says so over there in chapter 17. He says, because he has appointed a day of which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. I'll tell you somebody else who believes in judgment, Jesus. See, we, we, fought, we, we got this crowd today that just says, oh, God's just love. Jesus just love. He ain't going to send nobody to hell. I'm going to share with you. That's a lie from hell in just a minute. Jesus Christ does love you. He loved you enough to leave heaven to save you so you didn't have to go to hell. He believes in judgment. Listen to his words. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. It says that over in John 5. Acts 24 says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Here's a verse that you need to write down and highlight. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as, it has, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Any of y'all been to a cemetery lately? A few weeks back, Tammy's best friend uh, that she grew up with, daddy passed away, and we went over to the funeral over there in Walkertown. And went to the graveside service. We was over there. We were saying goodbye to Mike and Lori and, and, the, and her family. And Tammy was talking to Lori there. And I looked over that cemetery. And I was just looking over it. And then yesterday when we were down in Greenville, we were, I took Tammy downtown. She'd never seen downtown Greenville. And so there's this huge, huge uh, historic cemetery down there. It was established in 1812. And I mean, it just goes on. It's right downtown. It just goes on for a little ways. And I was looking at all them, them tombstones. Do y'all know the thing about a graveyard, the thing about tombstones and headstones? They just remind us that death comes to everybody. Death comes to everyone. I believe it was Mark Twain who said that death is the great leveler. No matter how much money you got, no matter how what kind of house you live in, no matter who your mom and daddy is, you cannot escape death. Only by the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ church uh, that we can potentially escape death. There ain't nobody that's going to escape it apart from that. And the Bible says it's appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. I want everybody listening to me this morning. Everybody. We all gonna die. We're all gonna die. And we will face the judge. There's a proclamation there to Felix. The possibility for him and Drusilla to get saved. But lastly we see. The procrastination. It says, now as he reasoned, this is in verses 25, the latter part of 25 through 27. Now he, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control, the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. His first response was he was afraid. He trembled. Became frightened. He was alarmed by the penetrating power of the gospel Paul was preaching. The plain, simple gospel. The preacher scared him. You know, I've had, got, I've had some people over the year, last 23 years that I've been preaching... And y'all know me, I, I, I get a little animated and excited talking about God's Word. And I've had a, over a few, just a couple of times, people come and say, you know, Terry, I, you might have scared some folks today. Can I tell you, if you're not a Christian this morning, you have every reason to be scared. You have every reason to be frightened.
He was frightened, afraid, translates terrified. I mean, the hair on the back of his neck was up. It was a conviction of fear, no, not of faith. Felix is having his moment of decision right here. Eternity was swinging in the balance. And he missed the opportunity to be saved. Did y'all know it says here in scripture he had knowledge of the way. He knew about Christianity. He knew Paul was innocent. He knew that he was a sinner because when he heard Paul's words, the Bible says he trembled. Yet in spite of all of that, he postpones a decision. He's reasoning. He says, go away for now. Procrastination. Over in John 5, he says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. There's an old English proverb. It says, one of these days is none of these days. Proverbs 27 says it this way in verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Felix, when I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. But yet two years will go by and that time never comes to decide. Missed opportunity. Felix and Drusilla let the moment pass by. Made the common excuse we hear some other time. Some other time. He says go away for now. That's procrastination. To put off, Listen, here's Webster's dictionary's definition of that. To put off intentionally The doing of something that should be done, even though it's known that there will be a negative consequence for not doing it. That's procrastination. Felix's indecision was a decision. I read this thing, and it's pretty pretty true. It talks about this illustration of four demons meeting with the devil. They commenced to make up a lie that would trap more souls. And here's what they say. Just tell them there's no God. Tell them there's no heaven. Tell them there's no hell. And tell them there's no hurry to make a decision. No hurry. How long will you wait? How long will you procrastinate to make a decision for the Lord? How long will you say, When I find time, I'm here to tell you God is a right now God. Today is the day of salvation. Over 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace, not with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, I was studying this week, and I come across, uh, I was uh, looking at James Montgomery Boyce's commentary. It was actually a couple weeks back when I was studying it. I, I was reading back over, and I came across Harry Einside. In his study of Acts, recalled a story of D.L. Moody. D.O. Moody, a uh, great evangelist, and he was at a real big meeting, and there was thousands there. Uh, and he had them stand up. And I'm about to have you do the same thing to illustrate what I want to say this morning. But he had every believer stand up. So, so if you've trusted, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're on your way to heaven right now. I want you to stand up. Just stand up. If you don't know or you've never done it, I'm asking you, don't stand. All across this room, people standing. All right, if you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ before you were 15, I want you to sit down. Okay, if you, if you came to know the Lord Jesus and you were saved, before, before you turned 30, 
I want you to sit down. If you came, if you were saved before you turned 45, I want you to sit down. Y'all see something here? The longer you put it off, the less probable you are to come to know the Lord. Young people, look around. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the longer you put it off, the harder it'll be. You can sit down now. How many are in hell today? Because they said, I got more time. How many are in hell today because they said, I'll do it at a more convenient time. How many are in hell today and say, there's no worry. I got the rest of my life ahead of me. How many? You say, preacher, do you really believe the Lord allow people to go to hell? Do you think he won't have compassion? Can I tell you, he's shown compassion for a long time, a lifetime for people. The Bible says in Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. If you don't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty is serious about this, I'm going to turn over and I'm going to read a scripture and we're going to be done. Revelation 20 lays out the great white throne judgment. I won't be at that judgment because I'm saved. Oh, I'll be judged. All of us are going to be judged for what we did with the Lord Jesus. But that'll be at the Bema seat. This great white throne judgment is for those that are, have never been saved. I'm going to read to you the words of God. Troubling words. For sure. No less true words. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. Hold right, on, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get, get, get in, the, in the light so I can see it good. <laughs> and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Can I tell you that right there? It don't matter how much money they got. Don't matter who their mom and daddy is. Small, don't matter how poor they are. Small and great. Standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works and by the things which were written in the book. See, see, you can't be good enough. It don't matter how good of works you do. It says, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There'll be no second chances in hell. What about you this morning? Anybody here unsure about your eternity? Anybody here this morning in your heart and in your mind? There's never truly been a time where you've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, repented of your sins, say, Lord, come and save me. If you're not 100% sure and confident, I'm begging you, do not let this moment pass by. Do not say, oh, I got time. You ain't promised to get to your car. Don't put it off. 
any longer. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online, and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.